As the number of civilians killed in Gaza mounts, new concerns are being raised about how Israel identifies its targets. The Israeli-Palestinian publication Plus 972 magazine and the Hebrew-language news outlet Local Call report the IDF has been using artificial intelligence programs, including ones called The Gospel and another called Lavender, to identify their targets. Those outlets cite sources that say the AI identified as many as 37,000 Palestinian men as Hamas targets. In a statement, the IDF says the machine-based learning systems are not used to identify targets, but merely as a tool for analysts in the target identification process. And they aren't the only country using it. Both Ukraine and Russia have employed AI in their ongoing conflict. And the U.S. military has hundreds of AI projects. All of this raising a host of legal and moral questions about how and to what extent artificial intelligence should be used in war. To talk more about this, I'm joined now by Jessica Dorsey. She's an assistant professor of international and European law at Utrecht University and studies the use of AI by modern militaries. And she is in Utrecht in the Netherlands this morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Let's start first uh, talking about how widespread the use of AI is in modern armies. Yeah, this is a technology that in every sector, everybody's trying to get their hands on. And that's, of course, the, the case in military use. We're seeing, as you mentioned, the reportedly widespread use of this in Gaza at the moment, in the Ukrainian battlefield. The U.S. is using it. Other countries are trying to develop it, test it, deploy it um, as well. This is something that everyone's trying to get their hands on. When we hear about AI warfare, we think of, you know, a sci-fi movie like The Terminator, for instance. But walk us through what AI weapon systems look like and what using them actually means. Yeah, that's sort of a popular fictional image of, of the way that AI warfare works. And that may be the case one day. But I want to push back a bit on that particular narrative because it's a bit more insidious than that. AI is a software, essentially, that can be used, as many of us do, we use facial recognition software uh, to open or unlock our phones. It's the same kind of technology that, when integrated into uh, drone surveillance, can find, fix, and finish individuals on the battlefield. That is to say, it's part of, an integral part of, the kill chain. Um, and that's, that's why it's a bit more insidious in the sense that it's not something as easily identifiable as a nuclear weapon, for example. There's not really a, a label that says, this drone includes AI. So that makes it very difficult to recognize. It also makes it very difficult, given that dual use nature of those technologies uh, to regulate. But we do need some regulation here. So that need for regulation, it also raise, raises questions about legal and ethical concerns. Um, what do you have to say about that, especially in the context of its use in modern war? What we're seeing, I think, on the battlefields um, in Ukraine and, and especially in Gaza, especially the report this week indicated that people are focused. This technology enables in every sector, but also on the battlefield, speed and scale. Mar militaries want this technology to outpace and overwhelm their opponent. And I follow that uh, desire. The other side of it, is that it brings risks with it, ethical and moral and legal issues that arise. So, for example, on the moral side of things, what we're seeing is a general decoupling of what it means to be human in warfare. We're displacing human decision making with that facilitated by machines or machine learning algorithms. And that has devastating consequences from a legal perspective as well um, uh, for the laws of war. So the fact that we're outsourcing the decision making means, in very concrete terms, in the Gaza scenario, we're seeing machines that have error rates of up to 10 percent. And that doesn't maybe sound like a lot, but 90 percent of the time it goes well. But that means that we know beforehand that one out of every missiles dropped based on these algorithms is on the wrong individual. And that leads to devastating consequences for civilians. Biases is also a concern, and you've done research on this. Um, biases in these systems in particular, can you talk more about what that means? 
Well, both biases uh, baked into the system. So the algorithms that have a failure rates with respect to facial recognition software, we've seen this in other contexts, but for example, it misidentifies particular skin tones or doesn't identify them in the same way, but also cognitive biases is also a real problem. So these machine learning systems and these AI um, processes are still from all reports, being run through humans to be approved by humans. So it's not the machines taking all the decisions. However, the speed at which they are generating targets up to 100 per day versus what it used to be of 50 per year, it's very difficult to uh, ensure meaningful human control. So when you're dealing with that kind of volume, and you mentioned earlier something like 37,000 targets that they're having to process, it's cognitively not possible to give meaningful oversight, which is required by international humanitarian law, to ensure that every target that you engage, every missile that you drop, has a positive identification of a legitimate military target. And that's just not possible with these machines. It's not what we're seeing. And then the devastating consequences are borne by the civilians on the ground. Based on what you've been saying, there is a gray area here. So what do you think government should be doing? Government, governance structures, governments, um, the international community, we need, the only thing in my view that we need to be in a hurry to do is not develop and deploy more of this technology, but rather regulate it. We've got to push up our sleeves and deal with some really complicated stuff. As I mentioned, the facial recognition software on our telephones is the same kind of system that's integrated in these kill chains. It's very difficult to regulate that, but that doesn't mean that we we shouldn't. And in fact, there are a number of initiatives underway, uh, but I don't think it's happening at quick enough of a pace. And that window, unfortunately, is closing. Jessica Dorsey, thank you so much for your time and your insight into this topic. Jessica Dorsey is an assistant professor of international and European law at Utrecht University. Thank you.